at it again, baby, and we got some more of Jordan Peterson. Let's dive in. Do you have any forward-looking views on where we're going? With Full debate, you know, this whole, I mean, what you've been going through for the last few years, every argument you've had. Do you have any sort of mid-term to long-term view on where we're going? Or if you don't, that, that's fine. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going in many directions at once. You know, and the question is, is, is the fundamental trajectory downhill or uphill? And I would say that depends on you. Western society in particular. What's that? Western society. Yes, yes. yes. No, and, and, and more globally. I mean, I worked on the UN Secretary General's report on sustainable development for about two years and read a very large number of texts on environmental uh, problems and opportunities and economic development. And what happened to me was that I got way more optimistic than I was before I started reading those books. I mean... So many things have happened in the last 40 years that are so good, you just can't believe it. I mean, we've lifted more people out of abject poverty in the last 15 years than in the entire course of human history, in terms of sheer numbers of people. You know, and starvation, except for political reasons, is now pretty much absent across the world. There hasn't been any wars in the Western Hemisphere for about a decade that's really something, you know. Getting kind of close to one now, though. Sheesh, Luis. When no major wars plague us at the moment, that's, that's quite something, given that there are 7 billion of us, and there's only going to be 9 billion, by all appearances. It's going to peak out at about 9 billion, and my suspicions are, in 100 years, one of the biggest problems we'll face is that there's just not enough people. And you never hear that, but I really do believe it's likely to be the case. And we can certainly carry 9 billion people without doing the planet undue environmental damage. And people who... There's going to come a point in time where there's not enough people? How? What number is that exactly? Like, I, w I would love for him to dive deeper into that. Like, exactly what he means by that. Not enough people. And what number is that specifically? Interesting. Well, you know, growing up, I always thought, you know, eventually we'll have too many people. We're not going to have enough space for all the people. And to hear him say that one, there's going to, there's going to come a time where there's not enough people. Well, looks like I got, um... Some kids to make. I gotta, gotta make sure I save the planet, all right? Okay. Claim otherwise, I think, well, I think a lot of things about that. But one of the things I don't think is that that's an accurate viewpoint. I mean, we're doing far better than we were 40 years ago feeding people, and we can certainly pack in another 2 billion. It turns out that if you want to control population, though I wouldn't really recommend that as an occupation, um, all you have to do is educate women, and that's the end of that problem. Then you also have educated women, and we know that's very annoying, but it seems to be, <laughs> it seems to be, you know, it seems to be working out. It's a great predictor of general economic development. It's actually, I think, the best predictor of a society's future economic development is the attitude that they hold towards the education of women, and luckily it's in the positive direction, and so that's very cool. And then it certainly seems to be the case that the fastest way out of a given environmental conundrum is to make absolutely poor people richer as fast as you possibly can. Because then they do things like, well, they don't burn wood anymore. Maybe they burn coal, and I know coal is evil, but it's not as evil as wood. And I don't know if you know this, but 1.6 million children die every year because of the indoor pollution that wood burning causes. It's like if, if the nuclear industry had a record like that, that is, is that true statistic? 1.6 million? Sheesh. Can we get a fact checker on that, please? Wood burning causes. It's like if, if the nuclear industry had a record like that, that would be all over the newspapers. But they're just third world children after all. So, you know, the planet has too many people on it anyways. And so there's all sorts of things I see that are so radically positive that it beggars description. I mean, India and China alone have greened an area in, because of agricultural transformation, the size of the Amazon, and partly as a consequence of increased carbon dioxide levels, an semi-arid area, it's either the size of the Amazon or Alaska, I don't remember which, has greened in the last 15 years. And so these are things you never hear. You have to ferret them out. But as What does he mean by greened? Let me know in the comment section, please. As far as I can tell, if we got our act together and actually wanted it instead of wanting to burn everything to the ground in an orgy of guilt-ridden self-destruction, 
we could set up a world in 15 years where absolutely everyone had plenty to eat and where obesity would be the primary problem. It's a good problem, actually. It's like, oh, no, you know, we have too much food. What are we going to do? <laughs> That's a good problem. And where everyone was educated because the cost of education is falling precipitously. And, and we could do that in a way that was actually beneficial to the environment, whatever that is. So, so I would say fu fundamentally I'm optimistic. But if we want hell, we could certainly have that. And you might say, well, you don't want hell. It's like, yeah, really, eh? You might want to ask your quest yourself that question real seriously because there's a part of you that would, would wreak vengeance on God for the catas catastrophic suffering of being. That's for sure. And that's, that's Cain. Right? So, no, I'm optimistic because I also don't believe that our fundamental motivations are that of a corrupt will. I think that's wrong. I think it's wrong factually, and I think it's, it's an appalling claim philosophically, and it's a radically destructive claim ethically, demoralizing, terribly demoralizing claim, and demoralizing enough to really hurt people. And I've seen many, many people, maybe thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands of people, hurt by that claim, hurt to the deep recesses of their soul. But I would say, like, it depends. Depends on what you choose to do. Really, depends on what you choose to do. You know, I read once, I think this was in a Solzhenitsyn novel, although it might not have been, and it's certainly not his idea. It's an idea from one of the church fathers that God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Nice mathematical model of God. I like it a lot. But there's that was confusing. God is a circle whose cir whose center is everywhere, but circum circumference is nowhere. Wait, how did he say that? The church fathers that God is a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Yeah, I said that right. That's a confusing statement. Nice mathematical model of God. I like it a lot. But there's something about it that's really true. You know, we. We interact with one another as if there's a spark of the divine within us. And you say, well, no, we don't. It's like, well, if you don't, then no one likes you. So, you know, that'll be its own punishment because we certainly do interact with the people we value when we're acting in a manner that we regard as appropriate as if there is something about them that's of transcendent and in some sense eternal value. And you might say, well, you don't believe that. It's like, well, do you believe in natural rights? Because... The notion of natural rights is predicated on that underlying presupposition or observation. And you don't believe in natural rights, well, well, then again, where are you exactly? And who are you exactly? <laughs> and those are questions very much worth posing. And so I think that truth is more powerful than deceit by a large margin. And I think love is more powerful than hate by a large margin. I don't mean naive love, and I'm not naive about people. I don't mean that at all. But I think it is possible for us to rise above the resentment of our suffering and to wish the best for all things. And I think we can participate in that. And you do that, well, by extending your hand to your enemy to the degree you're capable of doing that, because who needs enemies? Or maybe you do, but it would be better not to have them, I think, even if they're convenient targets to defeat. And then truth, well, that's the handmaiden of love. And that's something everyone can practice at every moment if they desire that. It's extending a hand to even your enemies with truth and love. And I feel like that that is such a, a, a good statement to make. And, I, and I, maybe not even necessarily enemies, but just people that oppose your ideas. Just extending an olive branch to them and um, showing them some love and uh, giving them truth. Because at the end of the day, that's all we can do is give truth. Like, I'm not... I'm not going to tell you a lie just to get on with it. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you the truth. I'm going to say it in as as soft as a way as possible, if that kind of makes any type of sense. But I'm going to give you truth, at least the truth as far as I know it. Now, if, you know, there's some other facts or statistics that back up something totally different, then I'll have to change my stance. But yeah, I think I think that's something that we should all aim for. Give people the truth at all times. Sometimes the truth hurts and that's fine. But we should always speak truth. Let me know how you feel about it. And that's an adventure, you know. If you're acting deceitfully, you already specify the outcomes of your actions and you pursue that. But 
The problem with that is it's predicated on the acceptance of your own authoritarian completeness. It's like, what the hell do you know about what you should have? And so what do you do instead? You just do your best to not lie and see what happens. And what happens are wonderful things, although perhaps not at the beginning when there's a lot of mess to claw through. So sorry for the lengthy answer. True. But it was a complicated question. <laughs> If anybody knows where this was, oh, actually, I think it said it. Hold on, hold on. Give me just a sec. Oh, it was at Oxford in Cambridge uh, in the UK. Okay, so this was this was pretty recent. I was just curious as to where this was, if this was one of his speaking engagements that, you know, they sell tickets for and things like that. Because I, I was thinking about going to one of them. What was I checking out? I was checking out a, a, a Dave Rubin. I was checking out Dave Rubin and Ben Shapiro, them talking and... They were talking about how Dave Rubin kind of opens for Jordan Peterson, and then Jordan Peterson comes out, does his thing, and then they do a little Q&A. So I just kind of got thinking, like, maybe I should attend one of these uh, speaking engagements, and so I thought that's what that was, but that that is something different. But yeah, anyway, y'all let me know what you thought about it in the comment section below. Like, share, comment, and of course, hit that subscribe button before you go. Let's lead with truth. And love, I'm out.